And, you know, there was, there was difficulty. The opening, we had a, a Duke Ellington tune that just made me smile, but we couldn't get it. It was so much money. I mean, not we. I mean, I was out of the process, but they couldn't get, they couldn't get clearances. But by and large, I think, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the package is, I would be very satisfied uh, seeing this about me. And, and I, the, the least I can say is how flattered I am by this praise. And um, Marshall, uh, do you have anything to say? I guess not. So, <laughs> but seriously, so many things have happened since I came to San Francisco last night. You want to know something? This was at the South by Southwest, the Tribeca Festival, Greenwich, Connecticut, uh, 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 Lake Placid. This was the most energetic, fun screening of all. You, you're the greatest. I'm, cur I'm curious, do you think that has to do with the size of the crowd or that there's a lot of Jews in the crowd? We're Gentiles both. have enjoyed it as much, really. <laughs> I suppose the fact that I've always been a, I mean, I'm not religious, but I'm a very high profile Jew. The way Richard Pryor was talking about black experience. I mean, I went to a school where, you know, Jew boy and all that, you know, I couldn't get into fraternities. They were white Christian only and all that shit. And uh, the world has changed, but I was molded by that, you know, in a way. So that my Jewishness was always in the forefront because I didn't want to, in fact, I had a long discussion with Jack Rollins, my wonderful manager who died two years ago. He was 100. He managed Woody Allen and Nichols and May and the greatest. And, and I said, I don't want to change my name like Woody did, you know, uh, Allen Konigsberg. I, I'm Klein. He said, hmm, Robert Klein. All right, you know. Biggest mistake I ever made. There are 4,000 Kleins. Hey, Richard, how are you? Calvin, I love your shoes, you know. <laughs> Whoopi Goldberg had the best, uh, Karen Johnson, her name was, she had the best name. I'm not so sure, but, but I, I felt like I had to stay with it. Although in my trips to Germany, there are more Kleins you can shake a stick at, if that's your idea of fun, as Groucho would say. <laughs> and they're not Jewish, I can guarantee you. There were five very frightened people in Berlin who were Jewish. <laughs> Marshall, I, I wanted to ask you, um, was it, what was the most surprising thing in working on this film about Robert that you learned? Um, well, I knew him pretty well. I, I'm, I continue to be surprised, and yet I shouldn't be, that the, at the reservoir of goodwill for him that it is out there, there's, people love his work, remember it fondly. Everybody that I mentioned who, uh, to that I was making this movie had a favorite bit, and that was really, you know, the... Uh, what was surprising to me was how much great material there was and how hard it was to narrow it down to the greatest hits, as it were. Were there some things that you wish you had kept in? Well, as, he, as Robert mentioned, we had uh, a very limited clearance budget, and so there was a, a couple of pieces that uh, we just couldn't get. We just I'll do it for you now, the things that were left out of the movie. There was one bit that he had his eye on that I said, oh yeah, that should be in there, you know? When I first heard, you remember the 50s were like, you know, on a day like today, I heard my mother say, whatever. And then I saw little Richard, Richard Penniman. I went up to Apollo with friends to see him. He was wearing these gold tails, silver tails. And, and he was outrageous. And some idiot from the balcony says, hey, you faggot. He goes, oh, you wish you could. <laughs> Imagine his lifestyle in rural Georgia in the 40s and 50s. This man was a hero. Anyway, um, my father sees this. He goes, what is this tutti fruity? What kind of lyric? What kind of stupid lyric is that? And he lived in an area, everything's up, that down. And the music goes round and round. Ooh, when it comes out here. This was his era. He goes, Tutti Fruity, what is this? Some code word with you kids? I said, yes, Pop, it's a code word. Tutti Fruity, Billy, Tutti Fruity, Harold, Tutti Fruity. 
Sally, tutti frutti, kill parents in their sleep at night, teenage signal. <laughs> Years later, my son, who is now 372 months old, I don't like to let go. <laughs> he was about 12. I go into his room, I see the Red Hot Chili Peppers video. What I got, you gotta give it to your mother. What I got, you gotta take a stick it in you. Give it away, give it away, give it away now. <laughs> I went, um, I didn't want to be on hip like my father. Uh, you know, um, I wanted to be that caring father. Hey man. Can we talk? <laughs> and I said, What is that stupid lyric? Give it away, give it away. What kind of respect for people's mothers? What kind of filth? What kind of... <laughs> and I said, What well, is give it away? What is this? Some kind of code word with you kids? <laughs> Ooh. man who begins to behave exactly like his father in the twilights. <laughs> and then there's an end to it, right? Oh yeah. Pat Boone made a cover which sold three times as many as, you know that? That was America in the 50s. Sold three times as many as Little Richard, you know. Tootie fruity, a little less hip. Tootie fruity, wop a -loody. Tutti frutti, wop a loody, a wop bop a lo bop a lop. He also made a cover of Give It Away, which was incredible. <laughs> Give it away to you. Show your mother all the love you can. Give it away. Give it away. The chili peppers wanted 20 grand to use that eight bars, those sons of bitches. So we had to switch gears. And you're the only audience that saw what isn't in the movie, in the... <laughs> now, I will now do shadow puppets on the screen. That was, you could get a merit badge in the Cub Scouts for that. I think I'm becoming, uh, hello. Yes. I think uh, I've sent this uh, film festival into anarchy. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> we like it. Here, I'm a stand up comedian. Here, I'm Trump. <laughs> China? I know China. I had Chinese food three times last month. I know China. By the way, how about this theater? Whoa! Give it an applause for this gorgeous house. And be comfortable in the notion that in every seat in the house, people sat who are now dead. It's very comforting. You know, you do such an amazing imitation of Rodney Dangerfield. Um, that's one of my favorite parts of the film. Um, do you do other imitations and impressions? I do Fred Capicella, the racetrack announcer. Good afternoon, racing fans. This is Fred Capicella. The track is fast, the day is clear, and I talk in a high, funny voice. And he was so, you know, he, they're off. Down in the outside, Rick Shaw second. Wilhelmina's baby third, Claptrap fourth in the outside, Miss Philly boy. And he was such a wonderful man. Rodney and I visited him. He invited us to his perch at Aqueduct. And um, he was such a nice man. He was unaffected. He went home at night. He was the same guy. Good evening, Mary Capicella. How do you do, Billy Joe and Tommy Capicella? Kiss daddy. Whoa, here comes mother with the dinner. I want the roast beef first, mashed potatoes second. String beans third, apple pie fourth, and the coffee in the outside fifth.
Now, Rodney was an amazing individual, street smarts, high school educated, wrote all his own stuff at the beginning. He had jokes worthy of Art Buckwald, as good as, and who's the guy from New Jersey, the humor columnist for the Times for years? Um, I want to say um, Russell Baker. He was a, a Russell Baker. Rodney had jokes like, I'll tell you, our schools are unsafe, our parks are unsafe, our streets are unsafe, but under our arms, we have complete protection, you know. <laughs> or, I'll tell you, I played some tough clubs, you know. Vito's, formerly Aldo's, formerly Frederico's, formerly Nunzio's. I'll tell you, this Nunzio's was a tough club, you know. You went into Nunzio's, you went down two steps, physically and socially. <laughs> he was magnificent, and he was a heroic parent early on because he came home one night, and his, his first wife, Joyce, who he had married and divorced twice, who was fragile and a mental patient and, a, you know, and, and, and uh, the kids were unsupervised and she was drunk on a couple of drinks and he decided to build a club, which is still in existence on Second Avenue. And every delicatessen waiter said, a club? Now? You know, the real bit. And he made it work. And later on, he wasn't such a good, his daughter, who you see in the movie, is a doll. She's a wonderful woman, married to a plastic surgeon. His son is kind of a mess and he won't communicate with the family. He kind of, you know, abandoned his parental role as they got older. Uh, but as a comedian, you know, his red tie is in the Smithsonian, and he taught me so much, and we were practically inseparable for about 11 years or so. He is a remarkable, remarkable comedian. In fact, as we were editing this movie, uh, Robert said that Rodney had a, a motto that we sort of followed in the editing, which was... Uh, uh, if the, if when there's a laugh, you don't need segues. Rodney used to say, when the laugh is big, you don't need, you don't have to worry about the segue. In other words, he finished saying, uh, I'll tell you, you don't, you don't know who to believe. Last week a hooker made me say please. And then he would say, well, I'll tell you. And then he'd go into a completely other subject. But when he had no discipline in his personal life between drugs and drinking and various things, he made it to 82 with the help of the uh, entire staff at Cedar sinai um, But when he had a Tonight Show, he would write, he would start two months earlier on a shirt cardboard from the laundry. He would write his jokes and try them out and get them right down to where Johnny would be off the chair and do it. And he was a, he was a very... He wasn't like a surrogate father, but more like an older brother to me. And, and, uh, but his, his daughter grew up in this atmosphere. How she grew up so well, I don't know, but she did. And she's wonderful, and we're still in contact, and so forth. Marshall, your turn. What can I tell you? That's enough. Anyway. <laughs> this guy had the idea to do this. And we made a sizzle reel. We made a five minute thing with me at the supermarket, with me doing shtick and a little work. And tell me, tell, tell me what happened. I uh, have a young friend who had the technology. I'm a, as I said, I'm a film critic, so I had the idea, but he knew how to do it. He had the camera and the uh, editing equipment. We put together a, a trailer. The first person I sent it to was Harvey Weinstein because I, my last book, he had published it. And we had talked about different projects. The Cassavetes book. The Cassavetes book. Uh, and he was the first person I sent it to, and uh, he said, well, I get it, we can do this. And I recognize just how lucky, how rare that is, how lucky I am that that happened. Because the first person he comes to, with it, they buy it immediately. So, it, it, yeah, that never happened. And it was a $20 million budget, <laughs> which we pocketed mostly, because it cost about $50, $50, I think, roughly, to make the film. You know, Robert, we're showing a film later in the week called The Last Laugh, and it's about humor and the Holocaust. And <laughs> I'm just wondering if there are certain lines that you don't cross, or what, what, you know, where's your line in the sand with humor? If you want to make a joke about the Holocaust or cancer, you better be good. There's no reason why you can't, because Holocaust 
inmates themselves had their own sense of humor, as did American slaves, as do the Irish. <laughs> no, I, I, this is not empirical or scientific by any means, but I've been asked the question many times about Jewish comedians, why there's a preponderance of them. I, I, I consider it like black basketball players. It's a tradition in a way. But while all cultures have a sense of humor of some sort, Jews are way up there in the stratosphere in terms of humor. And we've had to. And I, my, my feeling is that there's a connection between oppression and humor as a defense mechanism uh, to, to, to get along, to get through the day. Um, no, really, I had conversation with Elie Wiesel, with, with Arthur Gelb and I, we had lunch. And uh, there was a sense of humor among the inmates of the concentration camps. And the Irish, when I went to Ireland, I've been there a couple of times, I was so absolutely surprised from what I thought was Irish from the Bronx. You know, hey, G boy, what are you, you know. Um, I do believe there is a correlation between oppression and humor, but as far as your question is concerned, you can make a joke about anything, but it better be good. Uh, Gilbert Gottfried, who was a dear friend and all that, lost his uh, insurance Aflac gig because he made a joke after a horrendous earthquake in Japan, which killed thousands. And it so happens that Aflac does a lot of business in Japan, but maybe he should have thought a little about that. I don't approve of that sort of stuff. And when I, one of my Saturday Night Live hosts, there was a bit, remember Chevy used to do a bit behind the newsreader, making faces, you know, they're reading the news, he's going, you know, a kindergarten thing, but it was hilarious. So it's not important to the gag what the newsreader is reading. It could be some benign story. But one uh, week uh, on the Saturday Night Live, I was host, and they did an earthquake that happened in Sicily the previous week in which 10,000 people died. I thought that was terrible. Why would you, what kind of sensitivity do you have when people in Europe died from this horrible thing to doing it? So, and also, I have problems with a, a little, a bit of the cruelty that it pervades some comedy today and some of the profanity. I'm no prude. Profanity is important as part of the language, but not every other word. It's still a cheapo to use the profanity. And I see a couple of applause things. Uh, you no, know, it is true. I mean, in, in, in colloquial, everything is colloquial. My fucking kids, you know, or this and that. I mean, it doesn't jibe with me, you know. Use it where it's necessary, like Dr. O would, or someone, a great writer. So, uh, in the film, it seems that you were... What time is the yeah. cable car stop? Because I have to... <laughs> right. I played the hungry eye twice. I came here. Anyone remember the hungry eye? Enrico Banducci. Enrico's up on the hill. Joe's special. Go, go, girls. Oh, this city. Just I'll stay back in the background. <laughs> Just curious, do you carry your harmonica around? I have one in my briefcase. I didn't bring it tonight, but I always do. I don't break it out, you know, in an elevator or something. But I, uh, you know who I learned most of my licks from? Sonny Terry. Sonny Terry and Brownie McGee. I work with them at the bitter end. And... If you don't remember, Sonny is from Oakland. Uh, I mean, Sonny is from the Queens, New York. They're both gone now. And, and Brownie was from Oakland. And the, I found out later they hated each other. Their manager had again, but we got a gig. Oh, you know. Anyway, we're in the dressing room, and Sonny was blind, as you remember, and he had huge lips and huge hands, and he could single out notes, and Brownie had a high shoe. Remember those? You know, he was, he was uh, limped, and he played a, you know, mediocre guitar, and he was the cranky one. 
Sonny was kind of angelic. And they called each other River. What you want, River? I don't know, River. Which one do we do the second set? I don't know, River. Leave me alone, River. I said, Sonny, uh, Brownie, uh, uh, Brownie, why do you call each other River? Because it goes on and on. <laughs> and he showed me with those big fingers, you know, suck in. When you blow out on a, on a regular honer or one of these harmonicas, it's a polka. Renta, lenta, lenta. You blew in. That someone discovered, wah, wah. Ooh. Jews and blues, to me, go together. And Chinese food. You know, Is the organist going to play us off? <laughs> San Francisco. Dun, dun, dun. He was so busy, his feet, his hands. Did you see him? He's going like this. And, and he was so, the bow, he was wonderful. He was just so great. And here it is, my God. I'm serious, that's hard to do. <laughs> Little Bach would have helped at the end, you know. But, but he did San Francisco. We were in San Francisco. You want to ask questions? No, I'm just... <laughs> Go ahead. No, I, I have no questions to ask. I've actually, <laughs> I've seen the movie a few times. And I, uh, does the audience have questions? Yes, we're going to open up to the they audience. I have to shout out the question. Before we open it up to the audience, I just wanted to say... Uh, I'm sorry if I disrupted <laughs> it. No, not anyway. at all. I, I wanted to ask Marshall about his next project. Well. As I was saying, this one was so easy, and the next one is, is coming harder, but I'm trying to, I'm looking for the money to, I don't know how many of you have ever heard of a woman named Sylvia Weinstock. Uh, someone described her to me. Yes. That's one customer. There we go. It only takes one to come up with the money. Uh, I want to make a documentary about her. She's a, an 87-year-old woman who is, was described to me as the Vera Wang of wedding cakes. She makes uh, wedding cakes that sell for seventy to $100,000. Uh, if, you, if you Google her, it's Sylvia Weinstock, W-E-I-N, stock.com. You'll see it. It's amazing. She makes these huge cakes that are uh, were covered with horticulturally accurate flowers, created petal by petal, uh, by hand, by a crew in her, in her office, and she decorates each one herself. Uh, and she's 87, and she's just expanding, about to expand into Japan. But for the people that can't afford the 70 to 100, <laughs> she has a delicious babka for $3.99. And, but he's not making the film about the babka because the other one is more attractive to make the film. Anyways, we're looking for investors. If you want to get into the movie business, give me a call. And it's in 3D, too. The, you know, the flowers, it's going to be a big screen thing. It's not a small thing about the cake. This guy's making movies about cake. I don't know. So we have time for a couple of questions from the audience. Okay, well, let's go home. With this. We have you here in the middle to the left. To the left. Hi, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how much of your work is improv and how much of it is scripted. All of it is originally improv for my Second City training. In other words, George Carlin used to write like a playwright. He wrote down every word, he tested it out, then he would change, he would rewrite. And the stage manager at HP knew exactly his last line. With me, it begins as an improvisation. It belched out from I don't know where, and I don't want to question it. I started taking Prozac, and I was afraid it would bang, but it hasn't. It's fine. <laughs> I said, do I tamper with this mysterious head? So it begins as improvisation, and then becomes a... a, a a uh, set bit. When I get a laugh that rocks the house, I'm not going to change it. But I've never done a show in my entire career, thousands of shows, where I didn't improvise something. The room, uh, if I performed here, this room would be five minutes by itself. Because that's my training and that's my inspiration, improvisation. Paul Sills, one of the founders of Second City and a brilliant you know, improvisational teacher, used to say there is no laugh like an improvised bit. The explosion, the unexpectedness. So in my work, just like when I've been on Broadway, 
you must perform it like it's the first time it's ever been said, because that's what the audience deserves. They're not interested that you did it 200 times. So my stuff begins improvisationally, and I always add a little stuff, but once I get some good set bits, I'm not gonna let them go, you know? We have time for one last question right over here. So after your divorce, which looked really sad, sounded very sad, did you ever find another woman in your life? To Immediately. <laughs> you are now officially divorced. Okay, honey. No, um, my mother was dying of pancreatic cancer. She was 82. And I met this wonderful woman, and I was so in love with her. It lasted two years. I think it was a rebound thing. And maybe there's been one other relationship. It was so painful. It cost $600,000. My own lawyer was a thief. I mean, my own lawyer creating paper. I had never been in that world before. They smelled money. You know, I walk into her office in, Madison, in, uh, uh, in um, uh, Empire State Building. She said, I have a new client, Ron Darling of the New York Mets. I said, what business is that of mine? You know, I mean, that's a tawdry thing. Um, and I must say that my ex-wife kept it going for some reason. You know, you're hiding money, you're doing this. My lawyers and accountants who cut their teeth on my case before Robin Williams' massive divorce uh, a little while later said, just divide it up. We're not a community problem. And that wasn't good enough, you know. And it just lasted two years. I got a couple of ulcers, and I suppose it has a lifelong effect on me. Uh, uh, it had a lifelong, someone I loved and held close. And, you know, I, I, we, we, were, we should have been divorced because we were going in different directions. But, you know, to keep hammering at it, you know, at first she hired this, uh, uh, Ra what was his name? Raul, uh, Raul Felder, this, you know, shark in New York who goes on television all the time about divorce cases. And uh, it was awful. I'd never been anything like that in my life. So, oh yeah, 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 yeah. And my attorney stuttered, you know. Anyway, <laughs> I know, and charged fifteen hundred dollars a minute. So you know, you know like, oh, God, I'm done. And, uh, I did it back. Yes. Oh, goodness. She said, let's not end on a down note like that. She said, she wonders what I would like to leave you with. <laughs> what happens in San Francisco stays in San Francisco. Um, you know what? It's something I think I said e either obliquely or directly in the movie that I'm 74. I still work, I make people laugh. I don't have the kind of schedule I used to, which is fine. I was in a show called Mysteries of Laura. We got canceled, it's NBC. You can see how many people have seen the show. <laughs> um, you know what? I think it's a very high calling. My parents wanted to be, me to be a doctor. I wanted to be a doctor up to the point I went to college. A few things got in my way. Uh, calculus, physics. <laughs> Biology, organic chemistry, inorganic chemistry, reading, spelling, comprehension, behavior, aptitude, attitude, and talent. So I went in for history, political science, the proper preparation for comedy. You know what, I have few regrets in my life. One is not my profession. I loved I have loved all these years doing it. I get magnificent pensions from the Screen Actors Guild. Every movie I did, I've been in over 40 feature films, hundreds of television shows. You just take money out, big lobs of money. What the hell are you doing with my money? And now I'm getting it back. <laughs> and I intend to live to be 105 to get all the money from those bastards I can. <laughs> Making people laugh is the greatest.
Thank you for coming. You're wonderful. Thanks very much.